When studying Hess's law, and earlier in this chapter, we talked about how reactions often occur in a series of steps. So the reaction of hydrogen bromide gas with oxygen to form water and bromine actually occurs in three steps. The HBr and oxygen come together to make Huber. The Huber combines with more HBr to make Hober. The Hober combines with more HBr to make water and bromine. And we get our products. Each one of these steps is referred to as an elementary step. The Huber and the Hober are intermediates. They're a product of one step that later get consumed in a later step. They do not appear in the overall reaction. And as we said earlier, when dealing with multiple steps, there will always be a rate determining step. The rate determining step will be the slowest elementary step. And you can very closely approximate the rate of an overall reaction by looking at the rate of the rate determining step. The reason reactions occur in multiple steps goes back to collision theory. If we were to look at the overall reaction, I would need four molecules of HBr and one molecule of O2 to all collide with the correct energy and the correct alignment. Really, really hard. Imagine having four friends stand in a circle with you. Each of you throw a tennis ball to the middle and have all five tennis balls collide simultaneously. Then imagine like painting a dot on each tennis ball and have them collide with all of the dots touching each other. Nearly impossible. If you look at the elementary steps, what you'll see is that in the individual steps, you don't have five molecules or three molecules. You actually only have two molecules coming together at a time to collide. That's much, much more likely than having many, many molecules at once. So the reason that reactions occur in multiple steps is so that you can minimize the number of collisions necessary for the process to proceed. It is not uncommon to see unimolecular steps. These are steps when just one molecule decomposes into smaller bits. Bimolecular steps, like the ones that we just saw, are very common, where you have two molecules coming together and colliding. Teramolecular steps are possible, but more rare, and to go beyond having three molecules in a step becomes really unlikely. So when we talk about factors that affect rates of reaction, we've talked about temperature. You increase the temperature, you're going to have more collisions, and the collisions are going to be more energetic. They're more likely to succeed. Concentration is also a factor, and that's why concentration appeared in all of our rate laws. The more particles that are present, the more likely you are to have a collision, and the more likely those collisions are to become successful. We haven't talked about a catalyst yet. A catalyst is something that's added to a reaction to speed it up. It's not a reactant, it's not a product. What a catalyst does is it offers an alternate pathway, a different series of intermediate steps, but still gives you the same products at the end. The result is that a catalyzed pathway lowers the activation energy. By lowering the activation energy, it makes it easier to get to your activated complexes, which then speeds up the rate of reaction. So if we were to look at an energy curve for an endothermic process, I know it's endothermic because there's a greater enthalpy of my products than the reactants. The uncatalyzed pathway, or the normal series of steps, brings us up to our activation energy way up here. But by adding a catalyst, you can effectively lower the activation energy, and that will speed up a reaction. Instead of catalyzing a reaction, you can also inhibit a reaction. Now, it might seem logical that if catalysts lower activation energy, inhibitors would raise activation energy. If this were our normal pathway, and this were an inhibited pathway, there would be no reason for a reaction to follow that higher activation energy. The reaction would just more easily follow its normal pathway. So inhibitors do not raise the activation energy. What inhibitors do is they usually kind of steal or shunt reactants off into side reactions. They keep the reactants from colliding with each other and forming products. A final thing that can affect the rate of reaction is the nature of reactants. The number and types of bonds that a reactant have will affect how quickly it can react. Lots and lots of bonds make it harder to break. Double and triple bonds are harder to break than single bonds. So if you have a complex molecule with lots of bonds and many double and triple bonds in it, it may not react as fast as other molecules. The phase of matter certainly plays a big role. It's much easier for gas particles to collide with each other than it is for solids to collide with each other. In fact, you seldom see reactions between solids. You often see fluids coming together where the particles are free to move. The smaller the particles you have, the more surface area there is, and so the easier it is to have collisions with the particles. A big lump of flour lying on a counter can catch fire, but it kind of smolders. If you disperse it into a fine powder into the air, it can become explosive. The reason is, 
by dispersing it into the air, you have finer particles, which means that you have increased the surface area. Very little of that substance is in the middle of the particles. Most of it's on the outside. Whereas if you have a big lump, you'll have a great deal of material that's not near the surface of your sample.